welcome to VAR Blog, and today I'm here with Shiloh Logan, um, uh, no stranger to the podcast, but today he's here in his role as a PhD student in history and religion at the Claremont Graduate University. Um, we're discussing a paper that I did not sadly see you give, but we talked about it at the U.S. Uh, Society for Intellectual History, um, which I am always tempted to call sushi, even though it doesn't quite work. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I've been tempted myself. <laughs> um, and we're talking about something that's near and dear to me in a kind of strange way. I'm not uh, I'm not a native to Utah in any sense of that word, but I have been fascinated with the way as what Benson has affected the, the West. And also, I think, and you make a good argument for this in your paper, the entirety of the religious right and maybe religious extremism in general, because of the increasing role the West has played on uh, larger U.S. religious culture. And I think, you know, I make a lot of hay talking about how like evangelicals seeded their religious thinking to like Catholics and Jews who are out of step with their own community. Um, but one of the things that I have, that I have noticed is like, no, there's also a history of, of LDS and specifically strains of Mormonism having some effect on this that is dramatically undercovered. And in fact, one of the things that, it, you know, the, in the popular narrative around the LDS right now, it's, it's actually a moderating influence on religious politics in America. Look at Mitt Romney, look at the the church leadership pushback on like Trumpism in Utah. And yet, you know, the figure of Edra Taft Benson and like maybe legends about Danites and stuff. And for most of my listeners, this is all garbage goop to them, but um, really does have an effect on religion, on religious political thinking in the United States. Right. Um, so, to get us into the very basics, uh, what does Clive and Bundy have to do with Ezra Tan Spins? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great, it's a great lead in. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. So, so my work at, uh, as a PhD student, my, my dissertation is, is a somewhat autobiographical. It's uh, I grew up in, as a, as an active Latter-day Saint, I have Latter-day Saint heritage going back seven generations on both sides of my family. And I'm, I'm no longer a church. I resigned from the church here, uh, a few years ago, but I'm still fascinated. It's still part of like this cultural aspect of who, who and what I, I am, where I came from. Right. Mm -hmm. And part of that is growing up in this community that was affected by Ezra Taft Benson, specifically when he was the secretary of agriculture in the 1950s. Then as soon as he's out of this, being a secretary of agriculture, he comes back and he resumes his role full time as an apostle for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in that, for the next 10 years, he develops this philosophy that eventually permeates and trickles down into a lot of the church and, in, and really does a lot of effective heavy lifting in making the church culture ultra, the church culture ultra conservative. And it's, it's interesting. It's almost like a little bit of a code switching where Latter-day Saints and evangelical Christians, they, their conservatism runs so adjacent to each other, but a lot of the Latter-day Saint discourse runs on kind of a different epistemology. It, it, they'll use the same discourse, they'll use the same language, they'll use the same rhetoric, but their cosmology is different. Their kind of the essence is different about who and what they are. And so they might be using the same words and the same kind of the same general meaning. And they, and they, they're going to be right there with you uh, kind of step by step with, with the concern with the conservative movements in Utah or with the United States. But then there's going to be like these moments when all of a sudden you see someone like Ammon Bundy stick out and all of a sudden it's going to be framed as this radical extremist conservatism. And people are going to be like, what is going on in Utah? What's going on with what's going on with the Mormons? And it's it it really comes back to Ezra Taft Benson, because uh, to answer your question about uh, Clive and Bundy, Ammon Bundy and mm -hmm. a lot of the, the what we would label or what most people would label like extremist behavior, extremist political behavior. You know, I, I put the word extremism into my paper and and somebody challenged me on it. And the reason why I put it in there was not even necessarily because of that. 
that I think extremism is an inherent is an inherent category that these people fill, but that that's how they perceive. That's how that's how they're looked at. That's how they they're pushing back against something that they think is is wrong, and vehemently so. And that code that the Bundys are pushing back on is basically called the proper role of government, and mm-hmm. that. What Ezra Taft Benson wrote uh, in in 1968. So when uh, 1965 comes along, 1966, he's actually tapped by the John Birch Society. The John Birch Society has put some pretty interesting people into power through the Republican Party, and they think that they can get him the ticket to be the pres- next president of the United States. And so when they get him, they they're trying to get him into uh, into that position to be the Republican nominee, and he doesn't get it. But in the meantime. He's working behind the scenes really hard to be able to put together this political philosophy because as he looks at the world, you need to have a principled, systematic, axiomatic philosophy that if people understand you, they'll know what policy you support before they even ask it. It's once they know your core principles, they'll know where you come down. And and this is what he calls a statesman. So Benson always laments politicians, but he always advances the cause of the statesman. And it comes down to, he ends up creating this philosophy, the proper role of government as that principle when for him planning to run for president, that this is going to be his, basically his platform, his presidential platform. And when you look at the justification for why the Bundys did what the Bundys did out in, in Nevada and Oregon, and what a lot of uh, these, a lot of these groups, a lot of, you know, sovereign citizen groups or any other what you consider ultra right wing conservative group in this like this liberty community in Utah, libertarians, some anarchists, some anarchists, things like that, they will commonly cite the proper role of government. That's their marching order. That's their worldview. That's where they they move and act from. This is, I mean, this is actually interesting. And there's a couple of parallels to the evangelical movement that I think are not obvious if you don't know the deeper religious history of the United States and what Edward Felt Benson kind of represents. One of the things I like to point out is like, it is not natural that when the LDS start to reconcile with the U.S. federal government and incorporate that they would go anywhere near the Republicans because historically, just, you know, after Lincoln, there is literally a plank in the Republican Party platform to call for the extermination of the LDS. Uh, and all Mormon groups, you know, not just the LDS. I shouldn't just limit it to them. But, like, it's explicit in the Republican Party platform. It is not hidden at all. And in some ways, to me, that's somewhat similar to what you see with, evang- with evangelicals. The evangelical movement's always been plagued by its racial history in a similar way to Mormons, but also in a way that's very different. Um, and by that, I mean, like most of the denominations of the evangelical movement in the South actually split off from their mainline, uh, you know, versions over slavery initially. It's not even questions of theology in most of these cases. The Southern Baptist split from the mainline Baptist over slavery. The Methodist uh, are a little bit more mixed, and they're also a little bit more mixed in the evangelical movement. The, The exceptions would be, I guess, would be like the Northern evangelical groups like the Missouri and What's the other super conservative sent out of the Lutherans? I can't ever remember. But like those groups don't come from that. But most of the evangelical movements like, OK, yeah, we we don't want people realizing that we left over slavery and also were very tied to the Democratic Party till probably about the 1950s. Ezra Taft Benson is interesting in that. <sighs> you know, another thing that you can kind of see in the early church is it has a very, I wouldn't say communist in any formal sense, but it has a very communal anti-market identity um, for a long time uh, until, but one that is also not really interested in like external government at all or government socialism in any way. Like, but you know, when I point out like, you know, the LDS have a very developed charity network from like before they were, they would have seen this as charity as like, this was an internal way of taking care of binding the community. There is almost a very communitarian ethos. that doesn't seem to naturally fit with people like the Birchers, right? Um, And yet very clearly 
I mean, there's a lot of ironies about the Birchers. The Birchers explicitly based themselves off of Leninist cells. Like, it's kind of funny. It was very much like, we're going to use the communist evil ways against them <laughs> um, in their attitude. But with someone like Ezra Taft Benson, what he, well, you know, what you kind of point out in this paper is he reconciles Mormonism to, to some way to be able to speak a language that both seems like it's the same as modern American evangelical and other kinds of, of even mainline conservatism. And yet I hate to use the word dog whistles because it's, that has explicitly racial overtones and that's not really what I mean here, but it wristles to a different theological and epistemological framework that somehow been made copacetic to this evangelical movement. And I think we kind of still see that today. Like there's this, increasing push particularly for the lds but we also see it in like the church of christ mormons which people forget were a thing um that have also reconciled into the broader you know protestant movement um to be both a people apart and also a people together i mean one of the things that i you know one of the big things recently is like the lgs church convincing google to put the cross symbol on them as opposed to the the angel of moroni symbol which makes them look like a more conventional christian church and while you know people are like oh that's trying to confuse people about the the lds but the lds has always thought they were christian the reason why they didn't put the cross symbol on was they you know that was the bad fallen corrupt christians and we're the true church right uh we don't and yet now there's this way in which there's a normalizing effect there and i think what's interesting when you talk about ezra taft benson is in some ways he is both a a a way to people like george and mitt romney and a way to the bundys like simultaneously and that's kind of hard for a lot of people to to comprehend if you're not used to LDS discourse, which I wasn't until the last couple of years living here. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there's a lot, a lot to parse out there with, with what you said. It's, you know, so I, I don't focus a whole a lot on the early 18th century antebellum period with the with the development of the church. Of course, I know it really well, but it's that's just not my area of specialty. But it's it's fascinating because when you have the development, the early the early Latter Day Saints, the early Mormons, they really did consider themselves as the epitome of the American Republic, and mm -hmm. they were shocked. I mean, their identity was shocked when the American Republic turns against them, and and it, that was just kind of their their reification of their narrative about being God's chosen people in that God's chosen land, God's chosen constitution, this thing that God had established had been perverted and they were going to be the ones that were going to carry this away. And so when they're driven out of the United States and they go out to, to what's now Salt Lake and out to the Utah, uh, to the Utah territory, they see themselves, you know, of, of course, this is a common motif for people who are kind of driven out of their and displaced from their land, but they see themselves as the Israelites in, in, in the Bible being driven in, in Brigham Young as the Moses. And yet they still maintain this American identity that at the core, they are the true sons and daughters of the American Republic. And, and this does keep this affinity for the constitution and for, and for their own kind of their own Republican virtues as they go out there. Mm -hmm. But but again, right as Joseph Smith, uh, just before he's killed in, in 1844, the, the church ends up establishing, or, there's this private group called the Council on 50 that they establish in Nauvoo, where they have a secret group of leaders of the church that are trying to plan for a theodemocracy, where they're going to plan, if Joseph Smith is elected as president of the United States, then they're going to kind of try to evolve the constitution to become more of a theocratic democracy with Joseph Smith at the head. And then Brigham Young tries to recreate this in Salt Lake. And so there's like this evolution of constitutional republicanism while they're doing this thing. Then Brigham Young tries to set up his own nation with Deseret. And that's why I-15, for those familiar with I-15, um, the, the freeway that runs north and south in Utah and runs all the way out through Vegas and into Los Angeles. That's why that freeway exists because that's the corridor that Brigham Young wants to take to create an ocean port for Deseret. He wants to co-opt all that land for his own nation. And so all of the cities along the way are basically a day's ride journey all the way down. So it, it's a pretty interesting history and how that still functions and, and how we see remnants of that, of that history. But when they went down to Chihuahua, where there's still like remnants of other Mormon <laughs> communities, right? right? And in California, I mean, very few people realize that San Bernard, the whole San Bernardino, was founded by the by the polygamous Latter Day Saints, and mm. 
and so that was their uh, that was their one of their early satellites in trying to take over Los Angeles. But as polygamy came again, you know, the United States came against them for polygamy from 1890 until well into the first two decades of the 20th century. Um, the Latter Day Saints said, said the church said they weren't practicing polygamy anymore, but they still were behind the scenes. But this is really kind of a transitionary period where they're trying to out America Americans. They're, they're trying to out Republic everybody else. And this is when they start ingratiating themselves into the Republican Party, because like you said, the Republican Party, you know, had put into the in, into their platform that there's the twin relics of barbarism of of, uh, of slavery and of polygamy. So they were coming after, you know, Mormons were wrapped in and kind of in the same evil milieu as slaveholders in, in the mm -hmm. Republicans view. And so the Mormons grasped towards the Democrats and more and but it was through the early 20th century they started trying to get back over into the Republican aspect of things. And then Benson was highly Benson was highly influenced. It's kind of interesting. He's a little bit more he's a farm boy in Idaho. He's born in 1899. Mm -hmm. He's a farm boy in Idaho. He rises up through the agricultural community in Idaho. He wants to be a farmer. He gets his master's degree, which is kind of a weird thing for someone to do for a Latter-day Saint to do kind of in that time, in that place, but he's getting his education, formal education in agriculture. Um, he tries to get his PhD, does a little bit of PhD work um, along, along the way. And he wants to do farmers co-ops in Idaho. Like he supports these farmers co-ops in Idaho. Um, he doesn't want the state involved, um, but he's doing these kinds of like communitarian, like you were talking about, this, there's like remnants of this community building that he wants to do. But then once he gets in there, he's highly influenced by another apostle, by another leader of the church, J. Reuben Clark, who mm -hmm. was heavily political, who was heavily conservative. And uh, J. Reuben Clark, you know, he'd even, uh, he was getting really wrapped into the, the whole protocols of the elders of Zion and kind of the anti-Jewish uh, movement. And he had, mm -hmm. he had had some sympathies for the way Germany was treated after World War One. And with what's one going on with uh, with the socialist states there in Germany so during World War II, not quite a Nazi, but not qu not quite. But he, you know, he's like things are th he's like things are complicated, kind of a guy. And so right. he, he, but he he's very very conservative minded at the same time and constitutionally minded. And you know, the, there's even statements going and being floated around at the time, like the Constitution is much a part of my my scripture and as much a part of scripture as the Bible is. Mm -hmm. And so when Billy Graham comes onto the scene in the fifties and all of a sudden we have McCarthyism and we have Ezra Taft Benson, who's in Washington, DC serving as the secretary of agriculture under Dwight D Eisenhower. And he gets to think that McCarthy is, is amazing. And Hoover is his best friend and, and you know, his ideological best friend. And by the time the fifties are over, I've joked a little bit that uh, the Ezra Taft Benson is the is the Mormon version of Billy Graham, uh, mm. just 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 for the fact that what Billy Graham is trying to do in the fifties with really trying to revitalize the community and turn it towards the Bible and being that anti communist kind of rhetoric with like pro America sentiments and save our country with the Bible and, and get ourselves back on place, Benson does the same thing but kind of with the Book of Mormon in the sixties. And so he becomes kind of the echo. So these Latter-day Saints are, they're following, they're getting into the same conversation. But by this time, the Latter-day Saints aren't leading out in the conversation. They're kind of an echo a decade behind and doing it in their own discursive way. The, the only way that they're kind of informed by. And so that really leads into Benson's philosophy. I, and I guess to make sense of it, uh, for those who aren't aware, you know, who don't know it, Benson's proper role of government and the principle that he uses is actually pretty simple. Um, he claims that in a, in a constitutional republic, all power rests in the individual. It's the individual rights, individual liberties, inalienable rights, inalienable liberties. They're God given to each and every single person. And I don't have more rights than you have. We're all equal in our rights. And so therefore, when we band together as a society of individuals and we elect a representative, we can only elect that representative to do something that we ourselves can do for ourselves, that we have the right to do for ourselves, because mm -hmm. we all have the same rights. And so we can get together in a community and we can pick someone in our community and vote for them. And then we can give that individual certain things to represent us in. And we can enumerate them and put them down. And then we can give that list to our representative to act in our stead and then send that person to represent our neighborhood or community or state, whatever. And in Benson's view, this enumeration of duties is the constitution. And we, we as the people can give our representatives power that we ourselves possess, but we cannot delegate to our representative 
any power or duty that we can't enforce personally ourselves. So for instance, and as he argues that I can't go next door to my neighbor next door and say, Hey, I have this really great social program. Let's go take care of the poor. Let's go, let's go do, let's go build a road or let's go do something and then force my neighbor to pay for it. I don't have that authority. So I can't, I can't choose a representative to go do that for me. Right. So whenever government acts beyond what an individual can do themselves, that's tyranny. If the government assumes the power, that's usurpation. And if they act on it, that's tyranny. So in a lot of the cases, when you see a lot of these cases, like with the Ammon Bundys and the, the standoffs, and, and you hear the rhetoric, you'll start to hear a lot of this rhetoric where usurpation and tyranny start to enter the discourse a little bit more than most Americans would think is natural because of this proper role of government rhetoric. It's this idea that the constitutional law is defined by whether or not the individual can define or can enact it and enforce it themselves. That's the test. And if the individual can't do it themselves, it's it's blatantly unconstitutional before it even began. It doesn't matter if it's gone through the process. It doesn't matter if it's actually gone through everything. It doesn't matter if the law was created right, if it was signed off by the president or if the you know, judiciary. It doesn't matter any of that. A, a law is constitutional or not, based on the fact, if you can reason, I have the authority to do this myself. And if you do, then you can delegate it to the government to do it for you. But if you can't, then it's tyranny for the government to do it. And that it's pretty much that simple. I mean, what strikes me is like how both this rhymes with like the, the normal like conservative liberal Lockean proviso, and yet it's actually in some ways far more radical because uh, if I actually take this very seriously, um, I also can't force my neighbor to pay for an army. Yeah. Like, um, which, which even like, you know, unless you're an anarcho-capitalist like Murray Rothbart, like that's considered a function of legitimate governments by most conservatives. Like, okay, yeah, you can, but, but that's legitimate. And is this an exception? Like, or is it, you, they just turn a blind eye to that? Or is this actually part of their thinking? No, so there's going to be a lot of uh, minarchists and anarchists who are going to read Rothbard and who are going to take that. They're going to, you know, they're going to be really inculcated into Mises and they're going to be studying that kind of way of looking at it. Um, Frederick Bastiat and the Law is another really big mm -hmm. philosophical treatise that they'll turn to and they'll go to. Um, and so, yeah, this is this is where they're looking on going with it. Now, I personally grew up in a home that did take it to those logical extremes and mm -hmm. and, and really informed a level of like the sovereign citizens who believe that it's an illegitimate government, that the way the government uh, operates, taxes, interacts, has built the system, um, the banking systems, the welfare systems, the licensing systems, the corporate structures, the corporate licensing and, and regulating are all illegitimate government. And that the, and based on the proper of government axiom that um, based, it, it gets into an interpretation of scripture where in, uh, in the Doctrine and Covenants 98, so this is a revelation that Joseph Smith was given, that Joseph Smith was given from God. That's that's the Latter-day Saint mm -hmm. uh, claim. But uh, in section 98, uh, it, which is still canonized scripture for Latter-day Saints, uh, it says that God commands his people to obey the constitutional law of the land. Mm -hmm. And the constitutional law of the land, it defines as that which def which supports the liberty and freedom of all mankind. So, so when Benson renegotiates with this and is adding a lot of classical liberalism and is kind of renegotiating on things like Rothbard and, and, and Bastiat, this, this fits. This is a, a really uh, clear and, and way of being able to negotiate with Section 98 in a consistent way in his mind. And in DNC, I think it's 98, I think it's verse 11. It has this short verse that says that uh, we are commanded to forsake, to, to cleave into all good and to forsake all evil. And anything that violates this principle is evil and of constitutional government. And so it, there's this there's a seeming scriptural mandate from God that uh, based on this disinterpretation of scripture, that revelation of God comes first, obedience to the law comes second, obedience to the law if if it follows the constitutional law of the land. And so in that way, you see, like, for instance, with Ammon Bundy, he's in the news recently. And you see that even right now, all of his antics, you know, like, is, is he just, is he just a crazy person? And the fact is, no, he's, he's not. He's, he's acting 
very consistently with the principles that he says he believes in and that, and that are there for him and how he sees the world. Um, he's actually being very metho methodological and very, very principled in his way. And kind of once you understand the worldview that he's operating by, you can, you can plant his course and see his trajectory from a, from a bird's eye view. <laughs> and it, it doesn't make, it doesn't, it doesn't cause you wonder anymore. Um, you see where he's going with it, but him attacking the government or he doing what he does is always in view of, of that, of that lens and of scripture. And so it's, Benson, you, know, you brought up, you know, because from the paper that uh, that I presented on, that Benson really does try to mix and marry the John Birch Society rhetoric with the Latter-day Saint discourse as though not just that they're compatible, but they're the same thing. Right. And and so in doing this, it's like there's this, this marrying for the first time in a way that hasn't been done before, a, a reimagined version of classical liberalism with, with Latter-day Saint discourse. And that really is gets the the ball rolling and the, the snowball kind of pushed down off the mountain. And uh... yeah, I mean this this does. I mean, when you look at Amon Bundy, like for example, he has some stances that are somewhat hard to square with people even in his own larger networks who are not LDS. For example, Evan El, uh, Bundy was like kind of loosely sympathetic to Black Lives Matter because it was anti-government, um, and. And that made sense to me once I kind of grokked where he was coming from. And yet he's also sympathetic to groups that, um, you know, you could say are at least Western chauvinist groups, such as the Proud Boys, Three Percenters, and Patriot Player, or outright racialists, such as, you know, Cleon Skousen and uh, those guys, Um and yet you can also see how he could still be fairly sympathetic sincerely to things like Black Lives Matter because it's within this framework of legitimate government. And like, well, you don't have legit, like, you know, we can't go ask the government to go suppress black people ourselves, like, and, and have someone else pay for it. Like, that doesn't make sense. Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's interesting. And, and, and it throws people off. I mean, um, there is uh, Ezra Taft Benson is interesting to me when you think about this more moderating wing of the LDS now who wants to like morph it into mainstream society. He is a person that they can do that with, but they also have to kind of distance themselves from some of the implications of his rhetoric, but they can't abandon him because he's a president of the church and an apostle. You can't do that. So like, um, yeah, it's a catch 22 for the church. Definitely. It's, it's, it's not, it's not easy. And, and I, I've heard, you know, you hear a lot of rumors when, you know, once you start talking to a lot of people and, you know, just about how that, that because Ezra Tapp Benson did eventually become the president of the church and mm -hmm. in the Latter-day Saints worldview to become the president of the church, I mean, it means something. It kind of validates like ex post facto, all of the things that you said before along the way. It's like God, it puts an extra stamp of God's approval on everything you've ever said before um, in, in that. In kind of like discourse. becoming the Pope. I mean, yeah, I kind of. No, it's going to make LDS uncomfortable to make that. But like, <laughs> yeah. actually, in some ways, it's more than becoming the Pope because you you have authority, um, morally, not just theologically. I mean, like to get into like the fine points of of Catholic dogma. Technically, the Pope the Pope is not morally infallible, and neither would be a president of the Church either. But a president of the Church is appointed by. God directly to be both a theological and prophetic and moral leader, right? Like for people who don't quite get that. Um. Yeah, it's it's really sticky. Yeah, because you have now, so for instance, the the president of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles just passed recently passed away, M. Russell mm -hmm. Ballard, and he'd been on there for decades, you know, since I even I was a kid. And so they just they just called a new apostle and. And once you become an apostle, it's it's the second highest quorum in the church. It's the second highest governing body in the in the in the church with uh, with twelve men, and you cycle through by seniority. So you, you once you come into the quorum, you're you're the very last one, and then as people die in front of you, you basically move up in seniority until you're the last one surviving, basically. And that once the president of the church dies, 
the last remaining apostle becomes the next president. So, so there's a little bit of a difference, be, you know, between that and the Pope, right? Because the Latter-day Saints know who's going to be next. And, and they kind of figure that that's how God keeps the pulse on who he wants to be in the office because he, he allowed that one to live longer than the rest of them. And, and so once he becomes the president of the church, the central to the Latter-day Saint identity is the idea of the priesthood. The priesthood was restored through Joseph Smith with mm-hmm. all the keys of, of, of Christ's church to, to effectively have all of the ordinances of, of salvation and to be able to, and to make the prophet, the, the prophet and seer and revelator and the high priest of the church. And so, yeah, what he says goes, but, but it's also kind of funny because at the same time, Joseph Smith has this, this famous statement where he says, I'm only a prophet when I'm acting as such. Right. So but similar out to Catholic it is, Catholic. it is, but, but there, there's, no, there's never any objective epistemology on what that means. It's like, well, when are you and where, when aren't you? And it's like, well, when I am, I am. And when I'm not, I'm not. And come to find out that's always determined in retrospect once the prophet has said something and it's always given as divine revelation at the time. And then as you've marched and you put time away from that event, and if it becomes bad enough, like Brigham Young slavery is, you know, rhetoric or things like that, or, you know, that, uh, the black people, you know, that the black race were fence sitters and that they were people who couldn't make up their mind in the preexistence, you know, this kind of rhetoric. And all of a sudden when you get into modern audiences, like what, you can't say that that's, what is that? And they're like, Oh, well, that was his opinion. He was come to find out he was speaking as a man back then. Yeah, you know, and so there's this there's this you kind of have amnesia. This Festo revelation that invalidates when the prophet was acting as a prophet and when they were not. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And so and so there's a little bit of that going on with Benson, um, mm. in that with a lot of what he said in the in the 50s and the 60s, uh, the the leaders of the church actually most of them didn't really like Benson at, at least as much of his political rhetoric, and they thought that his political rhetoric would actually divide the church and, and send it down a pretty steep path. And so even Benson's counselors, um, Gordon B. Hinckley, who became the next uh, president of the church, and Thomas S. Monson, who then became the church after that, um, they were always trying to run behind Benson's back to basically thwart anything that he was doing with, with these constitution groups and with Cleon Skousen and, and, and what have you. And so it's it, the church was, the, the leadership of the church weren't all on board with this. And, and you hear stories and you're like, yeah, they're even still trying to figure out how to renegotiate and, and grapple with this right wing conservative aspect of the church that they think is harmful to the growth of the church because it always puts the church in a negative spotlight when these things come out, like with the Bundys or what have you. And so they're always trying to negotiate on that. And it, it's hard be, just because of how this idea of revelation works in the leaders of the church and what is true and what is not and how do individuals gain their own testimony of the church and their own witness of the truthfulness of the church. And when those feelings and witnesses that gave you a testimony of the church are the same feelings that testify that the constitution is the word of God and that you have to act in this way to be able to, 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 to support God, then you've wrapped in your political discourse with your emotional reification with your church identity. And all of that's informing in all cylinders firing at the same time that everything that you have based your knowledge on is telling you to go do this thing. And that's when we end up seeing things like, like uh, the Arizona standoff and the Oregon standoff and these instances mm-hmm. of a protest. I mean, it, it's interesting to me because on one hand I have had the narrative where like, okay, well the LDS, like they uh, have better relationships to Jewish people. They weren't engaged in anti-Semitism, which is kind of true sometimes, but not always. Um, and they, uh, you know, there was all this guilt about their position on race in the past. So they, of course, they would never make, uh, you know, outreaches to explicit racialist stuff today that ties into like pre Dred Scott interpretations of the Constitution or people who don't think the Civil War amendments are valid. Um, uh, so there's that. And yet, I do think about this. I mean, to make a lot of Catholic comparisons, um, I'm going to make everybody uncomfortable today, but um, there is a way in which their view of the of the Constitution resembles like C. Davidicus' view of the Pope. 
Like, if the Constitution doesn't do what we think the Constitution's ultimate bedrock does, then that's the Constitution being unconstitutional. Um, you know, for stuff like, I don't know, income tax. Like, right. like you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> A lot of that changed. So when uh, when Benson came out with the proper role of government, the implications of that were, everybody knew the implications of that. And, and so all of a sudden you ended up with a lot of the tax protesters um, that's where my family came into it. My, my father came into it and used to, used to lecture with it on the constitution mm-hmm. in the late seventies and early eighties used to lecture. My father used to lecture with, you know, at, at times he had get guest lecture for the Freeman Institute, which was uh Cleon Skousen's group and, and would talk about tax law and about how, you know, do estate planning to be able to get the, you know, those I, damned IRS agents off your back. And, and, and so that was, that's that idea that, government's tyranny, they're coming after you. But when Dallin H. Oaks was called into the 12 in, in the mid 80s, he had been working with, uh, as, a, as a professor at the University of Chicago in law, he had been BYU's president and he had also served uh, as a judge. And so when he came in, he was actually, getting, he was on a short list of two or three people to actually be Reagan's next tap for the Supreme Court. And so it was either going to be him being an apostle or he was going to the United States Supreme Court kind of a thing. And he chose to go to the church and his philosophy, his conservative philosophy, which is much more conservative in a non-libertarian kind of way. And so a non-Lockean conservative, it's uh, it's more kind of Hobbesian, if you would. And so when he ends up taking over his influence has been really heavily felt since Benson died in the early nineties and, and his legal advice, his legal uh, influence. And that's really where we see the church moving away from as hard as they can away from Benson's particular type of conservative rhetoric. Um, Because we have a lot of, uh, of that going on in the church leadership, which again, they didn't like, most of them didn't like Benson's rhetoric. They didn't like his political philosophy. Um, they just couldn't deny publicly that he was the man in charge because he, he outlived everyone. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, there, there is that element. I mean, you know, there, there is a way in which, in a very literal sense, the particularly the, the modern LDS are a gerontocracy theocracy. Um, and, um, uh, like in a very, like, like actually that's a justification. You live long enough. You're the elder. It's necessarily gerontocratic, which is not entirely true of the early church, but that's, that's beyond the scope of this conversation. Um, but it's interesting to me with the, like the two visions of political leadership that you have and which I've, I've, I've said that like, in some ways, Edgar Taft builds and leads to George Romney and thus met, but also, I mean, in that his model of engagement with the Republican party and that's early on, but he's also a competitor, literally a competitor with George Romney. I mean, they're both running in 68 and, you know, who does Ezra Tampist and run with? So just to make it kind of the obvious why the church might have problems with this today, even though they can't deny Benson is, you know, the Birch society wanted him to run with Strom Thurmond. Like, right. Uh, who had just recently given up being a Democrat. And um, and then, like, when that fails, he goes and, like, tries to help out George Wallace. Like, right. George Wallace actually sends a letter to, to President David O. McKay, the president of the church at the time, asking David O. McKay to release Benson from his duty so that he can run on a third-party ticket as president with Benson as his VP. A- after Benson doesn't get the, the Republican nod with Strong. And so, and Ben, and that's when David McKay just like cuts, cuts everything down. He's like, nope, we're not doing this anymore. He basically pulls Benson back in and, and doesn't let him be the political guy anymore. And so he's like, you're not getting the Republican ticket. You're not doing that thing. We're, we're not playing this game anymore. And so you see Benson kind of walking back from, from that after that. But yeah, that's, that's a crazy time. The late sixties are a crazy time for that, uh, that thing. I mean, but it is interesting because when I first heard about Clavin and Edmund Bundy, I assumed that they were FLDS, not LDS. Like, when, like, wait, like when I was, I was abroad, I hadn't lived in, or I had just, wait, when did that happen? Arizona was what year? 2014. Yeah, I was abroad. So I was abroad when that happened. I was like, oh, it must be, it must be more FLDS shit. That's literally what I thought. And, 
And I was surprised to learn even back then that it wasn't, that this was just like a particularly virulent interpretation of normal, of like, you know, standard LDS doctrine. This was not anything fundamentalist or polygamist or particularly, you know, uh, 19th century L uh, Mormon, you know, surviving into the 20th and 21st century. This was modern. And that surprised me, given that I had associated, well, like, I'd always been like, well, the LDS are really concerned about respectability, so of course they're going to be, like, kind of center Republicans, and they really want to downplay the, the early history of race. They want, to, they want to talk about how Smith was anti-slavery, kind of, sort of, not really. And, um, uh, you know, and... It seems like Ezra Taft Benson is still sort of like a giant thorn in their side for that because he's hanging out with neo Confederates. Like, um, <laughs> you know, like, there's no way around that. Like, yeah, um, it's really it's really sticky, especially you know, through the late seventies when you when the church is trying, you know, it ends the race ban on the priesthood. So because up until 1978, if you were black in the church, you couldn't have the priesthood. There are certain ordinances you couldn't you couldn't be sealed in the temple. You couldn't have certain ordinances you know, that uh, Latter-day Saints commonly think are life-saving ordinances are necessary for eternal salvation. And then when you have Benson coming out with this kind of rhetoric, with this particular group who's also adjacent to exactly what you're talking about with these, these very racist... And then Benson ends up uh, getting in on the bandwagon, the anti-civil rights bandwagon. Um, mm. And calling it the a grand communist conspiracy. I mean, if and you're the, hanging out with Birchers, you kind of have to, like, right? Right. And yeah. so it's and so liberating liberating this part of the population is is a communist conspiracy, and they they don't feel like they're standing in the same kind of racist shoes as those in the South because of the proper rule of government because they they believe we have the same rights as as black people. Everybody has the same rights. Like, like, like we don't have more rights than they do. They're, they're children of God too. And they have as many inalienable rights as we do. It's just that there's this other thing going on. There's this tribal lineage thing about being a part of the house of Israel. And we become a part of the house of Israel through our priesthood power and through these priesthood ordinances of being able to adopt ourselves into the children, the family of Abraham and in, in, like within the church, there's a, there's a special blessing. You get it usually once in your life called a patriarchal blessing. And there's a, usually in every stake, there's at least one patriarch who's specially designed to give this particular type of blessing. And they usually give it to teenagers, um, 14 or older. And in that blessing, the patriarch will actually tell you what tribe of Israel you're in, whether or not you're in, you know, the, the tribe of Gad or Asher or, you know, of, uh, Usually, most everybody is in uh, is in kind of through Joe's of an Ephraim. Ephraim is like the biggest one that everybody's usually in, but you can't be grafted into the house of Israel if you're of a particular type of lineage. You're cursed. You know, there's a there's like a curse uh, for that, and so all of that's being renegotiated with. And Benson's still trying to do this political philosophy by people who are holding on to these racial remnants, and the church is trying to kind of get out of that conversation. And as soon as Benson, so Benson becomes the president of the church in the mid eighties, he ends up passing away in the mid nineties, uh, 94, I think 93, 94. And then Gordon B. Hinckley, his counselor becomes the new president of the church and is the president of the church until 2000 and I think early 2008, uh, maybe late mm -hmm. 2007. And Gordon B. Hinckley basically revamps the, the face of the church. He really wants to bring the church out, out of this kind of, kind of obscurity and make it mainline, make it, make it to where it's like normal. So where people are, you know, it's not this really peculiar, weird kind of group out in the West, but it's like, it's, it's your, it's your next door neighbor. It's everybody's favorite person. You know, they'll bring you cookies kind of a thing. And so he ends up getting on 60 minutes and for the, you know, he's the first person to do a national interview in this kind of way. And he puts this new public image out for the Latter-day Saints. And, you know, you talked about, uh, uh, the, the fundamentalist in 2000 and uh, early 2000s is when under the banner of heaven is mm -hmm. John Krakauer's under the banner of heaven comes out. I, I, and I, I don't have any reason to defend it or, or to not defend it. It's not very, very good history. Um, it, you know, it's one of those things where you start with a thesis and go out looking for evidence for it. And that's just not how you do good history. But he, 
he writes this and it's still one of the, the best selling books on the Mormon genre today, 20 years later. And this is coming along just as Gordon B. Hinckley's trying to do this really good face for Mormonism. And then you end up having this kind of thrown back at you and about the Lafferty's and what happened in the early eighties. And it's always this kind of thing that there's the, the church is always trying to renegotiate its image. You talk, you talked about Mitt Romney and you know, we have the Mormon moment, right? In 2008 and again in 2012, and there's argument that there's a second Mormon movement going on in the last four years with how the uh, the media has covered documentaries about Mormonism from everything from uh, from uh, things like with, uh, I forgot his name, um, Hoffman in the 80s and the murders yeah. in the 80s and the forgers in the 80s. And there's documentaries about the fundamentalists and there's documentaries about people leaving the church and there's documentaries, there's documentaries about all sorts of things. And then you have people like Trey Parker and Matt Stone from South Park who are always talking about the Mormons. You have the Book of Mormon musical and 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 you have this thing to where Mormons are always feeling like they're they want to be a part of the conversation, but they're always kind of the one who's adjacent that's it's kind of the weird guy in, in the community. And this really does affect their politics. They, they they want to be ingratiated into the political conversation. They want to be brought into that political conversation. They're trying to be more normalized, um, even through the, the early 21st century and over the last 20 years but things keep on happening and, you know, you'll get under the banner of heaven or you'll get this. And so finally when Mitt Romney gets in there, you know, based on his father, based on his father, he would be running against Ezra Taft Benson. Romney is not a Benson Republican in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And so you see this new face of Mormonism coming out about what they want. But then at the same time, now there's an inner attention in the church of these constitutionalists, these libertarians, these anarchists, and that's when they start. And that's when they start coming out and acting out. I mean, this is this is actually an interesting division because I remember, like, uh, you know, Ezra Taft Benson fans recently being really mad about the the current uh, quorum of the twelve being like, get your vaccine, um, and like some people leaving the church over it, which I just found funny. But um, it, it did sort of like all of a sudden like the tensions in in utah politics made sense to me because utah outside of gomorrah aka where i live salt lake city um is an almost entirely republican state now if it wasn't so gerrymandered it would be like it would it would be less republican but it would still probably be like 60 percent gop 70 percent gop even without the gerrymandering it's a very republican state and yet Utah has like basically there's two kinds of Republicans here. There's Romney Republicans who have slightly more institutional power, actually. And then you have, I think of them as like Trumpist, but I really they're like Bundyist. Um, and and it does kind of manifest in the tensions between Mike Lee and Mitt Romney, right? Like, um and and it's very interesting because there's a group of very conservative in some ways, but communitarian, almost, you're right, Hobbesian kind of like, well, we have to like, you know, model communities for these fallen people, including these Gentiles, um, you know, strain. And interestingly, as if you're a liberal or a leftist person, these people are actually easier to work with. Um, whereas like on the other side, you have, like the Ammon Bundy's type, which could take your side on uh, randomly on something. Like I said, like Black Lives Matter, like Ammon Bundy had a weirdly pro Black Lives Matter statement while having segregationist in his larger network. Um, but he lost, he lost a lot of followers with that too. Yeah, he did. I mean, he, I mean, it was one of these few points where I was like, we were like, Oh, it's a dog whistle. I'm like, no, I think he believes it. It's just, you know, he's coming from this from a very specific way. It's, but it made it clear to me kind of the difference between Western and Southern conservatism, which was interesting. And like ben, the, the Birchers are trying to deliberately wed this in, in this Mormon figure and then these like neo-Confederate evangelical-ish figures from the South. But there's also a natural tension there because like, frankly, neo-Confederates do not give a crap about the Constitution. They think it's a problem. Like. Right. Like it's it, like you know it's like uh, we're constitutionalists if we can get rid of most of it, um, uh, and that's not going to be something that any like doctrinaire LDS person can explicitly sign up on, even if they're kind of implicitly on it. Like, 
Yeah, it's really hard to parse out, like I think the white Christian, because if you talked with a, a Latter Day Saint, it's going to be really hard to, for them to be able to parse out and to see their own identity about this white Christian nationalistic identity and philosophy that is grained into this philosophy. It's really, really hard to, uh, to see that. And w- what really surprises most people when I talk to them about it is that this liberty community that uh, that I study and that uh, I'm building an oral history collection on is that most of them are not Trump supporters. Mm-hmm. And, and and this really surprises most most people because they tend to think in, in this like this dualistic way that like if they're extremists, they must be must be Trump. Well, Bundy came out uh, with the Black Lives Matter. He also came out in in view of open borders, like he wanted open border. And so he actually talked against Trump's wall and that lost him a lot of followers as well. Like he was writing on like all sorts of communities supporting him and kind of one by one, he started like chopping them away with the things that he was supporting. And you like people are like really perplexed. Like, why are you supporting black lives matter? Why are you supporting the open wall, you know, and the immigration? So all of these extra other extremists that, uh, that you would label extremists, they look at him like, well, I guess you're not our guy. And, and I was actually really impressed with, uh, with Bundy when he was doing that, not because necessarily I agree with him, but because he is being very consistent to that ideal that, that as you kind of, you look at him doing what he's doing, he's a, he is following a very systematic way of doing what he's doing and acting the way that he acts. And with this proper role of government kind of, kind of rhetoric. And, and so you see with, in Utah, in some ways he seems to believe the efforts have been some more than Edward has been does. Yeah. Yeah. It's really funny because in the proper little gun. So it's this book, actually, I have a stack here. I got it. I got it back here. Um, it's actually this book. Mm-hmm. It's uh, an enemy hath done this. This is a 1969 book. This is a book mm. where he puts in the proper role of government speech I and mean, you can find it online, but that's, that's the famous book that he came out of. Um, Benson at the, at the end of the proper role of government, he starts talking about the government's right to tax. And, but he just mm-hmm. gave this whole long philosophical <laughs> treatise about how you can't force people to do things that you can't do them yourself. And that that really does just kind of shoot yourself right in the foot that I can't exact any money from my neighbor to for anything um, if we're doing this whole thing. And so Benson kind of starts to violate a little bit of his own principle right out the gate. And, and so there is... Uh, yeah, we, you start to see people who are trying to double down on Benson. It's kind of out Benson, Benson, and and that becomes kind of a, an interesting issue. That, that's one of the claims that I make in my in my research is just that the Latter Day Saint discourse works within this broader American discourse, and, and there's always been a tension from the very beginning between the Latter Day Saint worldview and the Republican worldview. Latter Day Saints see themselves as the epitome of the constitutional republic. The broader American republic disagrees, and so there's a tension. And as that tension grows and goes back and forth, there are there's a language that changed within the Latter-day Saint community that reflected the more broader American discourse. And this happened through the beginning of the 20th century, where you started to see that they, they kind of started having the same conversation. Latter-day Saints wanted to become more and more and more part of the Republic to where they, they felt a part of this thing, as opposed to an outsider for the last 80 years. And so they, they, as they were trying to get in, inside of it, it did change the discourse within the community. But at the same time, we ended up with, with Benson's rhetoric. Now we have Latter-day Saints that are making not the broader American discourse their primary identity and mode of meaning, but it's really doubling down on the Latter-day discourse as the primary mode of meaning. And it's really proving that, and it's then it's disregarding the broader the broader American. And that's where we end up seeing people like the Lori, you know, like the, 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 the Daybell situation mm-hmm. where if, if you lot looked at her, her, uh, her uh, court appearance and you and her when she was being sentenced, I I've literally been in rooms with Latter-day Saints who have given that exact same kind of testimony about their personal experiences, you know, spiritual experiences and other people around are like, wow, that's, you know, that's, you must be really close to God kind of a thing. And, and it really charges the room and it gets people really on the same page. And so this, this isn't something you would expect in church, but definitely in other pockets of, of the church in those meetings. And so they really do have this language of the church that they're using. 
but then they ignore the broader discourse and all of a sudden the laws don't matter. The broader American norms, traditions, the rules don't matter. It's all about the discourse that the latter saint discourse and what it can prove and the logical ends of that. And so that's what it makes sense. And when you, when you take that idea to Daybell's rhetoric, you're like, Oh, I, I see where she's going with that. She, she's not being entirely inconsistent either. 99.9% of Latter-day Saints are not going to do what she does, but mm -hmm. her rhetoric does fit within the Latter-day, the framework of the Latter-day Saint discourse. Well, I mean, there's a contradiction. I mean, you know, look, I, this is for me as an outsider. I was not raising it like you were. I just kind of live here. You can't live in Utah without having to deal with Latter-day Saint discourse. There's no way. Um, but I've been sort of fascinated, even with like, you know, you mentioned the curse, like, okay, why did they deny the priesthood to blacks? It's because the curse of Ham. Um, where does that come from? Interestingly, you know, and the long history of weird religious overwrite, that is a Jewish and Muslim discourse. I mean, the first time you really kind of see it mentioned is specifically the black peoples actually in like Ibn Khaldun and Javir al-Tabari. Um, that gets kind of imported in through Rashi into slaveholders who want to justify it specifically for black people in the South, which is how it gets into the discourse in the burnt over district, because that's a debate there. And it gets picked up by Smith at the same time. Smith is an abolitionist. Like, so there is this like long history that, you know, about these weird i mean no one in no one in the burnt over district has any idea that like this notion of the curse of ham comes from jewish and muslim sources and that like it's a weird reading by opportunistic evangelicals to pick up on a tradition that's kind of been dropped everywhere else and to reincorporate it as their justification for for specifically racialized chattel slavery um you know, which they're actually getting like Jewish and Muslim sources that's brought over through the Portuguese and then cleaned up and then made into some kind of like Protestant myth, which has no Protestant doctrinal backing, but is there nonetheless, right? And then that shows up in the burnt over district and then it shows up in LDS discourses, but there's a counter discourse in Smith himself because he's an op, he is, like I said, kind of sort of opposed to slavery. They're not consistent on that. But he, I mean, he was an abolitionist, particularly in the 1840s, and that's real. So, like, these are, this is a contradiction in the LDS. And, and it's kind of a contradiction because it's a contradiction in Northern American culture. Like, by that, I mean, specifically the Northeast American culture at the time in which the LDS is beginning to form a concrete identity, right? Like, so there is a way in which... Uh, the scholar Christopher Lash, actually, who like really misreads it, um, LDS and Mormon discourse, like he's like, oh, that's just working class discourse of the of like the burnt over district of the 1840s. And I'm like, that's uh, not that's really, really um, uh, optimistic of you to believe that. But um, he I do think he's right in one sense. It, one of the things that makes. LDS culture so problematic for Protestant Christians is there's like certain Protestant beliefs that are formalized and sacralized in LDS culture that were like folk beliefs that other Protestants believe they don't want you to know they believe it except for your racist granddad because like for example and you know I come from an interracial family but one of my one of my um, grandparents was a pretty avowed Southern racialist and. I heard the Carson Hand stuff from him. And then when I discovered that the LDS had uh, both believed it and abandoned it, I was like, what? Why would they do that? Because there's this whole other discourse in the LDS. There's a developed theology around it with the Nephites and the Lamanites and, and all that that is completely lacking in the Protestant discourse. But then you sort of like, you, you kind of retro-engineer it and you go like, well, they were part of this, this, uh, you know, they were in dialogue with this culture and they didn't really see themselves as totally separate from it. They were like, you know, the 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 Smith proposition is they were like the best real version of it, you know, like.
they, they didn't see themselves as breaking from Christianity. They saw themselves as like, no, we're going to out, you know, we are just going back to the old religion even more than the other Protestants are, you know. Um, I, I get that get complicated once you start going out West and you start having polygamy doctrines and all. I mean, and you start also having, even before Smith dies, split off groups like the Strangerites and all that, although they ended up polygamous anyway, which is kind of funny. Um, but these are things, these are things that I find, it, you, you know, your Ezra Chad Benson story makes interest in me, to me, we're talking about a completely different time period, but like, in a way, it is true that the LDS culture are both a people apart and also like, so very essentially weirdo American that you can't really see them anywhere else. Like, even though they're an international, very rich religion, you know, that has tons of of outreach abroad, but it's so tied into the United States history that it's hard to imagine it. Um, the like field I, of Mormon studies, the field of Mormon studies is really interesting in this regard, especially for the last 20 years, 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. because it's really brought out some really good scholarship in demonstrating the centrality that Mormonism has played in the formation of not just American religious identity, but of American identity itself. And that mm. is, that's really shocking for a lot of people because Mormon studies is not really something. When you go to an academic conference, you go to the American History Association, or if you go to AAR, Mormonism, you know, the Mormon crowd is not centered to any conversation. They're always the ones who still have to kind of fight and grapple for their, their, their seat at the table. But at the same time, there's really good read, like the very first Supreme Court case that comes about religion. The Reynolds of the United States is about mm -hmm. the Mormons. It's about the whole con, the whole thing that sets the ball in motion of the government really starting to define religion and religious practice is dealing with the Mormons. And this is where they have to start thinking about, well, you can believe whatever you want to believe. You just can't do whatever you want to do. Right. And so this, the belief action practice and duality that we now live by is the Mormons. And a lot of the Protestant solidification and reification of their identity is made in otherizing the Mormons out West. And so when mm -hmm. you see a lot of the newspapers and a lot of the, a lot of scholars are talking about how they print and how the, the East viewed the people out West and they used the, the Latter-day Saints as the antithesis of their own identity, that they were the embodiment of the thing we are not. And so it solidifies the good community out East with this evil other out West. And there's a lot of this going on. And so Mormons play that role in kind of playing the antithetical un-American role so that Americans back East can feel good about themselves. And so th a lot of this is happening on multiple levels. And when we have decisions that, that at the core of the nation define what religion is, how it's practiced, how we view it, um, that's one of the things I do in religious studies. I, I, I straddle to, uh, I'm an interfield in history and, and religious studies. And it's an interesting position to be in because, you know, I get on, I get religion on one side and I get the religious history on the religious studies on the other side. But one of the things that those scholarly works that are kind of in the middle here, we talk a lot about how the establishment clause that, you know, of the United States that talks about the government not basically making any specific state uh, denomination. And because of how the government originally conceived of itself and conceived of what this religion thing was, it never really defined it. But eventually the government had to define religion for the sake of knowing what it couldn't do. And in that way, government actually became the main purveyor and enforcer of what religion is, which, which, is, which is really actually kind of funny. When you, when you look at the government as like the deemed secular and what is this, what is the secular and what is the religious, you know, these categories overlap mm -hmm. so much, it's almost impossible to, to use these categories analytically with any analytical usefulness. But this idea of the secular being that thing which enforces and defines the category of religion in this country, and then come to find out, surprise, religion looks an awfully just like Protestant Christianity. So that whenever any other religion comes to the United States in order for it to gain legitimacy here, it has to change what it looks like. And what it looks ends up looking like is just a different version of Protestant Christianity. And and so Mormonism Absolutely. is central. Mormonism is central to that conversation. It's it, it it played a central role in forming and solidifying that legally and politically, and culturally, and and so 
slowly there are but there are some there's really good scholarship about uh, about that that comes into it um matthew harris uh that i presented with there at the conference at the sushi conference <laughs> mm -hmm. they uh he's he's done a lot of good work on benson he's he's kind of the preeminent benson scholar right now and that that kind of work is showing how much benson's political philosophy still affects this conversation with how the government and religion are always re renegotiating with each other. That conversation is always, always going on and religious identity is changing. Political identity is always changing and it's, it's a, it's an ever evolving conversation. And uh, yeah. So hopefully I'll be able to add my, my one, my voice and a little bit of whatever I have to say to it as I, as I get through school and, and uh, get out of my way. Yeah. I, I, um, uh... One of the things that I've become very obsessed with uh, myself, even though I, you know, I, I, you know, take the hard, I used to take the hard, like, post-Marxist, how you understand history is looking at the economics, which I still think is super important, don't get me wrong, but, like, I started thinking about the concept of, I'm just going to pick race, because it's come up in this conversation, but, like, like if you re look, read pre-Renaissance people, there is barely a notion of race. There's some there's some metaphors, there's some otherizing of Roma and Jews, but like and, and you know, Mohammedans who are probably some heretical Christians, we're not sure. Um, but the idea of of race, and I make this point all the time, like it, you don't really see the idea of Europeanness until Byzantium Byzantium collapses, like New Rome falls to the the Ottoman and the Seljuk Turks, you don't really see like blackness and white whiteness coming up until you have to justify maintaining uh, a slave trade with the Congolese and Arab slave traders uh, who might have, you know, African Christians in their midst, and thus you have to like figure that out. Um, and thus, similarly, I think, you know, interestingly, when you look at this, you didn't notice like, well, the whole concept of religion. Like, a 12th century peasant doesn't think of what he believes as a religion. Like, he thinks of what he believes as true. Like, there's no, like, there's no, like, secular, and this is, like, completely, you know, not part of this worldview. Like, even though, yes, there's a church authority that's separate from the, there's a church court that's separate from, like, the king's court, but they're both courts that I have to deal with and they're both legally binding. And I have like a concept of mine as a subject of the King, not really of the nation, but specifically of the King. And then I have this concept of, as a, I'm a subject of Christendom and in a way, the American problem <laughs> is like, we further reify that because we take this whole secularization stuff in some ways more seriously than Europe. But ironically, in doing so, we get more involved in figuring out what religion actually is. And you're right. Like, you know, American Protestant religious studies, uh, I say, I mean, I betrayed it by saying it's Protestant. But like, you look at like what William James thinks a religion is. And it's like, well, this is this like very liberal Protestant thing. And that's what he thinks religion is like. Um, right, right. Um, and, and you're right that the LDS are are crucial for this. And in a way that like rhymes with Jews, but is different because Jews are external, but not really because there's been Sephardic Jews in the United States going all the way back to like, I don't know, the 16th or the 17th century. Um, but one of the things you notice about the way, like say when Jews want to be recognized as a legitimate people who are not like a separate nation, what do they do? Well, all of a sudden the synagogues look like churches it, like go back and look at the old synagogues from the 17th and 18th century. They're even in a cross shape. It's bizarre. Um, and then they like, they dress up, they, they don't, they don't like, yes, there's Hebrew and Ladino publications going on in the United States, but it's like very on the low down and we're not printing it here. And the public discourse is very much in the discourse of Protestantism. Um, and Mormons are interesting you know, the burnt over district in general is interesting, but Mormons are like the Ur form of that in some ways. Um, uh, 
because it forces you, you know, the, these weird, these weird groups in the second great awakening um, really do kind of shock the system. Um, the shakers and the Millerites. And if you look at where a lot of the, like the weird religious weird, again, I'm defining weird from the standpoint of Protestant. I'm not even a Protestant, so I don't know why I do that, but because we live here, right? You still like all Americans are kind of crypto Protestants, whether we want to be or not. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> even when we're secular Jews. Um, so like, um, secular Jewish Buddhist or whatever. We're still kind of Protestants because we, it's how our, everything's been <laughs> fine for us. Right. Um, <laughs> There is a way in which, like, Mormons in particular become the other that is emergent from yourself, as opposed to the external others, like Catholics or Jews who are kind of internal, external others, are indigenous people, are, you know, uh, pre you know, pre and immediately post Dred Scott African traditions get incorporated. These are outsider things. We can define them clear as outsiders. You can't define Mormons as outsiders except by, like, almost sovereign exception. Right. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, Joseph Smith is not an outsider to to upstate New York. Like, there's just no way. Like, no, no I, I, he, he was he followed Methodism. Right. And really, really staunch in his father's universalism. And, and you know, it, it's fa fascinating. You know, you go back to the, to the 12th century. I think it's a, a fascinating thing to do, especially with the, the word religion. You know, it comes back from that that Roman religio. And, and what does that mean back then? It just meant, work, you know, kind of like a, like a worship and like a following. And, and up and until the time when we had the, the formation of the, when the, the kind of the Catholic Church became the Catholic Church for the first time. And religion was basically the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church was religion. But religion took a performative thing of just like it was the ritual thing. You had to do the ritual. You had to do the things and you had to do the things in the right mm -hmm. way. And, 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 and that was the important thing. And then when you ended up with Luther and you ended up with the Reformation, that that changes things because at that point now you have you have comparative religion now because you have two things now to like well well what's this and that's when the centrality of belief becomes important belief wasn't important before then this whole like religion thing and belief wasn't central to the to the project but then all of a sudden luther comes along and now belief is central to it in calvinism and as soon as you now have this schism where Christianity becomes something fundamentally different. It's it's not like the it's not like the the Orthodox churches and they split and they kind of they agree that they're the same thing. They just we're the ones who have the right authority, but it's it's a fundamentally different thing. They're no longer having papal authority. They're going to sola scriptura. They're, they're going to this the reason and rationality we can pull from the scripture. This is a whole different type of Christianity, and mm -hmm. so now they are taking this idea of this evolving concept of religion. And they trans just like you said, they transport it here to the United States, and that ends up becoming kind of the epistemic background, the, the noise, the coding, the codes, identity, all of American identity. So you're, you're right. It's like whether or not we're, we're actually we could be a an atheist Jew, and we're still kind of latent Protestants in America. It's just because that that's how we think. That's the culture of how we think. It was coded in that way, and I, I, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. I was just talking to Michael Beza and he was telling me the story um, of like this um, kind of secular Jewish polemicist in the in the middle uh, 18th century and how it, and I was like, well, this guy doesn't sound like a Jew. He sounds like a Puritan. And um and and then you go like and what he says is like, well, I am a Puritan. It's not about belief. This is just how they argue. And I'm one, like I'm of the same culture. And you're just like, well, that there is a way in which. You know, there's both a post-liberal and in my world, like even a post-Marxist, like not taking the kind of feedback loop of religious culture seriously on how it redefines all these categories and how you can't really escape it, even in a very material sense. Like the West, as we understand it, um, yes, is shaped by you know, what are we going to do with all these soldiers who we no longer are used to fighting the South? we got to send them somewhere before they accidentally get uppity and, like, try to take over the government or something. Go send them after the, the Native Americans expand that way. Okay, yes, there's that. But there's also this sense of, like, um, all these religious groups, particularly the LDS, but not just the LDS, who are like, well, we got to get out of New England because, you know, these Anglicans and Baptists and 
and more established, oh, people are never going to accept us. We're being kind of chased out on a rail. Well, let's just go further west. Like, and let's go to Mexico and like make it America, you know, uh, even though we're also going to make it our own country. That's there's a lot of interesting contradictions, particularly in the Brighamite side of things. But um, there, you, there is this sense of which, like, the LDS are a particularly pro, are a particularly American problem because they're both a rejection of the mainstream of the American culture, like you said, but they're also a manifestation of it. Mm-hmm. Like, and there's no yeah. way around that when you look at who's settling like mexico it's like a mixture of like filibusters and then religious dissenters um and then they just kind of get lucky after the mexican-american war like it's but even then that you like you know utah doesn't get incorporated into the united states for a very long time um uh you know it was what like a potential state for you know like most of the 19th century like yeah, it wasn't until like 18, what, 1896 or eight, something like that. Right. Yeah. And even then, like, you know, I, I, I talked about one of the ironies of the United uh, about about uh, Salt Lake City, for example, is during that time period, the first Jewish mayor in America happens in Salt Lake City. And it's basically because like, well, who who's going to get these LDS and these Protestants to agree? Well, let's find a third group, the Jews. They'll like sit between them and everybody will not trust them. So they'll trust them. So like, um, which is, you know, um, which is this interesting thing when when you meet modern um, LDS people, they're very proud of, oh, like we never persecuted Jews. And like, you know, even like look at Brigham Young, he gave the the Western Jewish community their first cemetery, which is true. Um, um, And yet, like there is this, like you kind of hinted at it, there's another side of this where like, the LDS are also trying to spit to fit into mainstream American Protestant culture, which has some uh, unfortunate other side effects that you kind of have to either accept or not. Like, yeah. so I find that I find it fascinating. I find I find I also like you um, came away with with this reading about the Bundys and the situation around that with like this odd respect for Eamon Bundy where I'm like, well, I think he's kind of a loon, but I also think he's a morally consistent like like he, yeah, he seems it's, to really believe this. Like, Yeah, it's like love him, or, love him or hate him, he's consistent with what he's doing and he's he's very open with his principles about it. And it, it, it's a weird positionality it's a weird positionality to, to say I disagree with this, but I also kind of respect it at the same time time right yeah in a way that i kind of like don't in, like you know from reading about ezra taff benson after after this you know after you talked to me about your paper like i said i didn't actually hear it sadly i had to i had to go that day um i remember looking all this up and going like well this guy's kind of a hypocrite a little bit like um the stuff with taxes and the stuff with like how you can have an army like just doesn't <laughs> doesn't actually make sense with what he said if you actually think it through it's you know it's kind of like um it's a similar we talked about the Lockean conservatism but there's like this similar like well how do you ever justify property if like like in the United States if your labor is what makes it property and like well but the weren't the indigenous people working on it and then you have to like come up with this weird excuse where what they did wasn't labor like right. Like, you know, um, it's not that, but it's close to that where it's, it's really close to that. You know, um, and then you meet somebody who's like, no, like we were wrong for taking it because it was what they did was labor. And, you know, we're going to outlock lock. And, you know, th- there's a way in which um, Edmund Bundy is in a way because he's so consistent embodying the contradictions of this position. Like, um yeah, he's gonna oppose borders because, like, you can't your your neighbor can't protect borders beyond their property line. Like, nope. what do you want? Yeah, like, that's that that's exactly right. That that is the that's the extrapolation of that principle, right? You know, so when you have the Latter Day Saints and they come out to Utah, mm-hmm. you end up seeing like, yeah, it is this Lockean thing, but also Brigham Young is you know it's the whole in, industriousness 
you know, to be industrious in the whole, in the whole B motive, you know, in, in, in the whole industry. And that's his whole thing. And so you begin to see like this time and labor Lockean ideal that comes into this Brigham Young philosophy that ends up incorporating and redefining Mormonism in the 19th century, where they, they do come in, they see the indigenous people, but the indigenous people are, are Lamanites, right? They're, yeah. and in fact, there's a lot of rhetoric, um, I, I'm, I'm having to study because I'm, I'm writing another paper on the evolution of the, the secret combination discourse um, and how the, yeah. the church has used uh, this concept of secret combinations and of evil things. But they often label the, 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 the indigenous people as the secret combinations, the Gadiatans, the people from the Book of Mormon who destroyed the Nephites. And so they start seeing things in the Book of Mormon motif that, that God's not actually protecting them in their land because the Book of Mormon says that God will actually take away from you your lands of possession if you're not righteous. And so uh, there's this idea that they're coming to, to, the, to the cursed people and taking away from them their lands of possession because it's prophesied in the Book of Mormon that that'll happen to the Nephites, the Lamanites, if you're not righteous. So you come in, you inhabit it, you're industrious, you mix your time and labor with it, it's now yours. And then, by the way, we have a moral obligation to go convert them because they are actually the people of the book that we're, we're, we're showing to the world that's us. Um, and so we, we have an obligation to them. But then when you actually hear about the genocide that the early Latter-day Saints caused uh, among the indigenous people along the Wasatch Front, that becomes a, well, that just, that just really complicates things. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, that's up there with the Mountain Meadows massacre and stuff. It's like, well, we, we, we can kind of talk about that, but like, not really. What? <laughs> like, like or, or even like when did the Danites stop existing though for real like yeah uh, for those of you who don't know the Danites are kind of a secret police force <laughs> like, are, um, is there still a Mormon also, mafia kind of an army like <laughs> yeah they're kind of a Mormon mafia slash Mormon like a Mormon version of the Stern gang if you know your, your Zionist history slash a, a, a religious enforcer group. It's really hard to actually even say what all they were. But, like, yes, uh, official LDS recognizes them as existing, but there's kind of a haziness about when they stop existing. Like, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, you, um, have them, you have them appear in 1835 as a way for Joseph Smith to somehow push back on the Missouri and, and yeah. antagonism. And they act in kind of two, two capacities. One is as moral enforcers of the Latter-day Saint community. And then number two, as, as armies to protect the Latter-day Saint community from the, from the Missourians. And very few Latter-day Saints actually know about how the Missourian Latter-day Saints actually caused and, and, and committed quite a bit of violence um, from time to time through this whole thing. And so... Yeah, they, How, weren't they, they weren't just persecuted. They weren't just persecuted. No, it wasn't no. just persecution. <laughs> no, they, they were dealing out their own. And so then at that point, when it comes back to push back on Joseph Smith for all of this, and the extermination order comes out in Missouri, then at that point, there's all the walking back of like, oh, no, 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 no. I didn't have anything to do with this. I didn't talk about this. This wouldn't have anything to do with me. You know, and, and so then you start walking back and all the people you're throwing under the bus are like, well, what about all the conversations that we had? Well, you're excommunicated now. And so because you're excommunicated, your testimony doesn't really mean anything to our community. So you're not, what you have to say is not valid. And it's really interesting is because even now that the testimony of those leaders of the church that were excommunicated or left the church or who disagreed with the daughters of Zion or the Danites, um, as they're commonly known, their testimonies are not as valid. And and they're not taken as seriously even now, which is really interesting. So yeah, when did the when did the Denites actually end? Well, who knows? You know, Latter Day Saints are still having you know historians are still having to prove that sometimes the Denites even existed. So it's 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 a weird place to be in. Yeah, I mean, it, the, you know, to be fair to the LDS, the problem that they have is that their religious history is modern. <laughs> Like, like, you know, the rest of us have, like, uh, like, <laughs> no one had printing presses when we, when we started doing shenanigans, so, like. <laughs> you know how awful it must be to start a religion in the age of the internet now? I did, I, that, would be, that would be the worst. So, yeah, yeah if it did. <laughs> For real, though, you always, like, Colt's got eight years for someone's going to out it, like, you know. 
<laughs> like you don't even have a generation, man. You got like half a decade. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, but it, it is interesting to think about. Like, I mean, one of the ironies I remember, like you know, the, the Smith had a particular dialogue about Mohammedanians himself and 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 mm. and uh, Islam, and it's it is like you know maybe you were more onto that than you realize. Like, and also on to the rest of us, too. Like, there is a way which, like, I wonder if we, like, got into, I'm almost certain that if we got into, like, old Christian movements of which there, it is a, you know, I, you know, I'm of the subscriber that, like, Christian movements were kind of classed and kind of not in their critique of empire, but they also don't have another language. They embrace empire. And, you know, this tension's always there. And it's, I think it's there in most religions, to be frank. I don't even think it's, like, a particularly post-Christian thing. Um I mean, try to figure out like what really separates Judah and Israel and from Canaanites in actual history when we can actually do archaeology. Good luck on that. Like, <laughs> um, so it's, it's, uh, it, I don't think it's particularly unique to either LDS or Christianity, but it is sort of like, I think one of the, one of the things that I've always kind of thought like, why do Protestants rev this really uncomfortable relationship? with the LDS. And I'm like, well, maybe it's because like the ingredients are too obvious. Like, you know, they're right there. Like, 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 it's just like, we like our stunts are in the past and it's harder to prove. Thank you. Have a nice day. Like, um, I've, I've had similar thoughts. I, I, it is the, the newness of, in fact, uh, Russell M. Nelson, what was it? Uh, just a couple years. It was, he's half the age of the church. <laughs> like, <That's... laughs> like numerically speaking it's that old <laughs> and the leaders of the church are that old um and it's 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 just it has a lot of growing up to do and growing up in a very weird time and in in information technology and yeah it's all of mormonism's shared qualities with protestantism and what protestantism wants to decry about mormonism are things that Protestantism does, but as you said, yeah, it's it's a lot of that's in the past, and they dealt with that in the past when they didn't have. All of that. Yeah, with, like you know, like yeah, or when they control the printing presses, like right. you know, <laughs> um, so those, you know, are you, you know, when they're standardizing the language and inventing the nations, like it's it's. Uh, Joseph Smith yeah. tried to do that, but he got killed for it. Yeah, it, 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 it's I, probably I, doing it late. Like, yeah, <laughs> he did it too late. It's, that was just, I mean, that was hit. I mean, it's interesting because I always, I think about I think about this with a lot of like descendants of burnt over district groups though because if you think about where like our weird American fascination like what are the weirdo Protestants and I say this from the standpoint of like the people that the other Protestants don't want you to look at too hard um, and it's not just the LDS it's also it also is like the Branch Davidians mm -hmm. the Seventh Day Adventist to a lesser degree the Witnesses and you keep on like looking at it and like they all start in the same place like it's like they all started upstate new york like it's just it's just like hmm something was going on but um i do think you know for all the talk of like america as a christian nation or a secular nation or whatever and and i think the mormons are interesting because it proves that both are true simultaneously because the whole category doesn't actually really make that much sense um uh, there is a way in which, like, I have found it interesting how much the burnt over district in, in like recountings of American history, like, it's mentioned, you know, like if you if you take your U.S. history class, someone's probably going to bring it up, and then we immediately do not actually talk about it, like, even though. It's the source of a lot of Amer modern American religious identity. I mean, you know, I, I admit because the state technically has to arbitrate itself as a neutral party in this. So it has to be very careful about talking about this stuff. But there is a way in which, like, there's a whole part of American history that's just like, we're just not going to talk about that. We're just not going to really deal with it. And it's going to keep bubbling up in the in the way that Ezra Taft Benton has this way that like I mean you're I think it's interesting um in an almost kind of dialectical way in which 
in some ways, in the mid 20th century, Mormons are behind the evangelical dialogue. But today they're kind of like in charge of it, like in some ways. So, you know, when I think about like the opposition to gay marriage, um, the LDS were in the forefront of that. You know, mm -hmm. they're also now in the forefront of giving that up. But like, it's it's very interesting to like think about the some of them are. Let me rephrase yeah. that. Like, like I, I foresee a lot of I foresee a lot of difficulty with schisms in certain religious future. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, which again, like that's not like that hasn't happened. That seems before. very prophetic. You should start a church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um you know, it, it's like uh, whatever. What I would read, what I would read, the, the what the wars and rumors of war line, and I'm like, well, that's like predicting rain and rumors of rain. But um, <laughs> religious groups are gonna schism. Who knew? Um, yeah. Particularly ones that are highly invested on beliefs. Um, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's <laughs> it, it is interesting to sort of like look at that, and I do think. I do think one thing we have to do, with, and, and this is to, to speak to your interest in both history and religious studies, which, by the way, as a person who is neither a historian nor a religious person, but as a as a person trained in both literature and anthropology, I'm always like, well, aren't they really kind of the same thing anyway? Like, how can you do religious studies without history? I don't really know. Like, <laughs> We um, argue this all the time. Like, like half the people in religious studies are like, what is this thing we're studying? Like, I, like, like, really, honestly, can we just stop having this conversation about like how to define religion and just be anthropologists already? <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, uh, that I always find I always like I like religious studies because I'm like, aren't you guys just like kind of sort of cultural anthropologists, but like have a specific subfield? And also, aren't you kind of sort of historians, but have a specific subfield? But you know, um, we're to we're totally different. Yeah, you're totally different. Well, just like uh, as a, as a funny side note, I'm going to leave this in the show to get myself in trouble. Um, I, as I, I mentioned to you, I'm a, I'm an MFA haver um, and a person who who is trained in in liter in literary studies and pedagogy and in anthropology, but more in literary studies and pedagogy. And I'm at the intellectual his you know the intellectual history conference, and I'm asked by a scholar who I won't name, like, how does it feel to write about um, history to kind of like move subfields well education and i sort of flippantly say without thinking about it well it, it requires me being more rigorous in my historiography and learning chicago and that's really the only difference and like <laughs> and he looked at me like i had just like shot a dog and i was just like <laughs> but like I gave you historiography, that's the important thing. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> what do you want from me? <laughs> but like, you know, I you know, I don't get mad that you're writing about literature. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, if we if we don't have historiography or, or Chicago, you know, what are we? But what are we more than that? I I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like, I do get it if you're talking about, like, material, like, like, if I'm dealing ancient history, like, I have to be, like, fairly conversant in, like, material decay stuff, and I gotta know a bunch of languages, and, but, like, you know, if you're just talking about archive work, I'm like, literary scholars do archive work, man, like, I don't know what you, like. Like, it's not like you're the, I mean, admittedly, we got lazy in the middle of the 20th century and just started, like, doing theory all the time, which which you know we have the opposite problem of history which is like theory allergic and then you know we're just yeah. like well all we do is theory now let's look let's find whatever weirdo idea died in the early 20th century and like bring it back as a theoretical framework because that's what we do but like <laughs> that that's you just described every day now of my life now where it's like i wake up in the morning as the historian who is adverse <laughs> to theory and i go to sleep at night as the religious studies guy who's just like always engaged in theory and and and, and the duality of this life yeah yeah i, I understand that I, I feel that deeply and i feel kind of offended <laughs> yeah well i mean also as as the as the literary <laughs> as the literary study guys is also kind of an amateur historian i'm always like well like some of us in literature should probably like give up some of our theoretical obsessions. Like we don't really have to justify everything with Lacan. 
And um, some of us in history could like do with being honest that historiography has a theoretical project to just be honest about that. Like, like, you know, it really is. Nobody wants to see it. So I'll, I'll give you a, there's a, there's a book we read over uh, in, in one of the classes. I just finished coursework. And so I'm done with course coursework. Thank mm -hmm. God. And so one of the books we read uh, um, when Jesus came, the corn mothers went away. Uh, it's a great mm. book, but he, uh, he starts with, citing Eliade, which mm -hmm. is a religious studies, a religious studies guy out of uh, Chicago in the say in the sixties, who, who basically is the guy who starts, he's kind of like the godfather of religious studies. He's, he's really kind of the guy who helps fo form it this together and cement this together. And I forgot that I was in a history class because I spent most of my time at that point in religious studies classes talking about North American religious history. And so I'm in a history class with non-religious studies people and they don't know who Eliade is. And so, so that was the point, we you know, we get to talk about Eliade for a little bit. And all of a sudden you see these, these students are all historians who now they have a little bit of theory. They're like, oh, this book makes so much more sense now. And, and that got us on a good conversation about theory and about how every book from these historians is, is dripping with theory. Uh, we, we, historians like to deny they're doing theory. And it's, uh, it reminds me of an old uh, John Maynard Keynes quote about economists. He's like, you know, people think that they have opinions um, beyond whatever economists that, that they're free from any of this other theory. He says, but the next words out of their mouths are basically the words of some defunct dead economist that they don't know about. And, and, and it just, it, it kind of comes into that same, that same thing for historians. And uh, yeah. Uh, and, and that's really why I like religious studies histories from think from people like Hugh Urban or, or yeah. Joseph Laycock, because they're historians that are, don't mind bringing in the theory and they're not apologetic about it. And I think it's, I know I think it's refreshing just to be honest about it. Yeah, I mean, I do think that, like, there are slight differences between religious studies, you know, intellectual history, and anthropology, but, like, they're very slight. Um, and I really don't, I honestly and sincerely don't believe that you can, if you're going to be re responsible in doing any of these, that you cannot touch on them and have to, like, you know, but... I don't know. I, you know, one of the ironies of the humanities right now is that we're all dying and we're all in denial about it. We're trying to like pretend that we're like, you know, separate from each other. And as, as simultaneously, the only people who take us seriously are podcasts and weirdo conservative Christians who want to have great books curriculums. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> which is <laughs> just, I actually was laughing. I was like, I remember when great books for like, um, and liberal education was like a communist plot. What happened? Like, like, you know, um, uh, but nonetheless, here we are with all of our contradictions. And you know, so the Mormons aren't the only people with contradictions, my friends. Like, no, no, they're not. They're not. They're just the, the flavor of the week that comes around every, every so often. Well, I mean, it is, I guess it is useful to be one of the, uh, uh, both a, a, a person out of, and also a scholar of, something that may actually have relevance. I mean, one of the things that I do find interesting, you know, as you talk about it is like Mormon studies is really, it's traditionally kind of relegated to two people, Mormons and ex-Mormons. Like, and it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like I joke about if you ever read the newspaper here in Salt Lake, you go to Deseret News or you go to um, the Salt Lake City Tribune, and like, there's a thing on tax policy, and all of a sudden, you got Mormons and ex-Mormons arguing about the legitimacy of Joseph Smith in the comments, and you're just like, I don't, you know. And Ezra Taft Benson actually is a way to kind of understand how that happens, because you're just like, wait, why does this matter? And you're like, oh, there actually is a reason. But like, to outsiders, it's totally like, what in the world? Um, but it is interesting because I do think, in a very real sense, if you want to understand American religious history. You have to understand the burnt over district and understand the burnt over district, you know, the, the most successful. Yeah, I think the most success, I mean, both in terms of membership and in terms of money um, church out of out of that movement is the is the various forms of the Latter-day Saints, the FLDS, the LDS, mm -hmm. the Strangerites, the Church of the, the Church of Christ, although churches of Christ are confusing. There's a lot of them. There's a lot um, of them. <laughs> it's like which one are you oh one of you is out one of you is actually mormons but you've been like hiding this whole time um <laughs> like, right. like the, the, the the church of christ uh, like has been was very before the lds was very much like we're just gonna pretend we're normie protestants we're just gonna pretend we're normie protestants like 
Um, they've been doing that for a long time. But it's an interesting thing to look at. I think you can learn a lot about the American history and the history of the West and the history of it. You're right, extreme of how political movements and, you know, and also kind of mainstreamifications of similar ideas by looking at the LDS. Like it yeah. becomes very clear that in some ways, like a microcosm of all the problems <coughs> you have in the United States, you can find an LDS culture. Yeah. You know, you, you brought up the, the burned over district, you know, there, uh, uh, Whitney Cross's book, the burned over district is a mm -hmm. very popular book that talks about it. Um, good social history. Um, Paul Johnson's book, the shopkeepers millennium kind of comes after and uses that. Those are both good social histories. Um, the one that really comes after that, it's still the standard in, in American religious history. It's like the top, easily probably with the top, if not the top book, at least the top two or three is by Nathan Hatch called the democratization of American Christianity. And it is. Mm. Uh, it, it talks. It talks about the burned over district and that whole area, but it also brings in, you know, some Methodists, the Baptists, the Christian churches, uh, the Black Church, and talks about Joseph Smith as well and Mormonism. And Nathan Hatch, you know, the book was written in the end of 1989. And for for those who are familiar with historiography and kind of the history of history, you know, the 60s and 70s really were to the social historians who were responding to to intellectual history. Intellectual history in the first of the 20th century was really all that everybody did. It was just histories of nations. And social history was really that thing that started pushing back and realizing, hey, there's a whole segment of populations that we have never <laughs> talked about. It's like, we, apparently you need to talk about women. And uh, apparently they have a story to tell and half the population had gone virtually unnoticed. And so you end up with social histories and you end up talking with other people and, other, and they end up taking it. And this is the time when a Marxist framework becomes very popular within the study of history because you end up having the, the tension, like, why haven't we talked about histories before? Why haven't we talked about these other people before? It's like, oh, well, we have dynamics of power and we have positionalities and we have these things that have never been discussed. And this becomes the way that religion is talked about kind of in a Marxist way is religions, you know, the opiate of the masses. And it's always it's a form of control. And, you know, we get a lot of that with uh, with with kind of Cross and with with Johnson and uh, the Shopkeepers Millennium. But it's Hatch's book in 89 that really turns the course of this because it's really the first cultural history treatment of the burned over district that was done. And everything afterwards, there's not been a book that's really unseated it in, uh, as the primary book of that category. They've just there's been three or four really notable books that have kind of critiqued it and then built on it. And it's really fascinating to, to answer because you brought up some really good uh, points a couple times about all of the different churches that came out of the burned over district and all of these different flavors that that like why did these groups come out of this and, and what happened and i think it's absolutely fascinating that we do have so many american born denominations and so Amer american born iterations of this christian thing and and, and like what is what does that even mean and so when you end up having the gatekeeping Protestant Christians who are like, well, you know, seven, are Seventh-day Adventists Mormon or are Seventh-day Adventist Christians or Mormons Christians or Jehovah's Witnesses Christians? Like, like who's Christian, who's not, and who, who's to say? But because they take that discourse of the dynamic of power from uh, that's kind of written into the American legal code, then th there's a sense that they have some kind of authority to speak to be able to define the category. And yet at the same time, nobody's asking the question, why are all of these American religions popping up? Like right. what made that possible? Like, like why is that even a thing? And not only that, but is like, why is Mormonism now the, the wealthiest church maybe in the world? Uh, and I, it's, it, it, I, I looked it up. Um, so it is the, it is the second wealthiest church in the world only because. Um, you know, all the Vatican's the, true holdings. Yeah, we don't know the Vatican's true holdings, and also each diocese is technically listed separately. Okay. The the church that is richer is the Greek Orthodox Church, but with the Vatican and Greek Orthodox Church, the reason why they're rich is not money. It's that they like have these like two thousand year old like property holdings that you know mm. they just kind of have. Right. Um, whereas, like, if you were actually to look at liquid wealth, that's the LDS. That's like by far by the LDS by a lot. Um. Why and, and why is that? I mean, because we can, we can take a Max Weberian approach of saying that Puritanism created capitalism, right? <laughs> you know, all of this, all of this, uh, this essence of like our uncertainty before God, and that we have to somehow prove ourselves, even though we can't prove ourselves, we're still going to prove ourselves anyway. And and in 
our doubt and uncertainty creates capitalism. And so we, we can say that American Puritanism creates capitalism, but that doesn't answer really why the LDS church has $200 billion and why other churches don't, but yet it happened here. Why? Yeah, it, yeah, it is. It, like, What's this that is thing? A, this, is a funny thing. this is a funny thing that I think even makes Protestants uncomfortable because it's just like, um, uh, oh, yeah, they have a lot of money. How did that happen? Also, like, they're big. They're not that big. Like, like, our, like there are there are plenty of, of Protestants. They, they, they report 17. Bigger. Yeah, they report 17 million ish members. But depending on who you listen to, I mean, there, there's there's a dozen people talking about what's the actual percentage. Um, so, so I've heard as low as maybe four to five million are active, um, mm -hmm. actual active participating members out of 17, um, because we know that they count on their demographic sheets that if you were a child and you were baptized and then you never went back to church, uh, that they will count you as, an, as a member in that 17 million mark until on record, you are 110 years old. And even if they don't right. know if you've died or not, they'll, they'll still count you as a member. So those right. those statistics are inflated about how many people there actually are. But out of 5 million, 6 million, even 7 million, let's say half of them, let, let's say half of the population shows up. $200 billion? That, that's, 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 that's pretty impressive. I mean, that's, I, I can't Mormons imagine. Mormons actually pay tithe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> is that, I, is, I, I guess, is that it? <laughs> um, no, I mean, there's also reinvestments. I mean, like, like, um, I, I do actually, so there are, there are repercussions for not paying tithes in, in the LDS church, yeah. which there aren't in other churches, but, this is true. um, but I, no, I, I actually, it is fascinating to look at because I have been like, how did they, what did they, how did they invest that well? Like, like, it's just like the Catholics don't do that. Like, yes, they have a ton of money, but like, they're not like liquidating Michelangelo's to invest it. Like, um, it is, it is an interesting and very particularly American problem. And yet like, so there's that. And, and uh, the other irony that I was kind of thinking about, as you were mentioning, like, the uh the, the gatekeeping of who counts after the burnover district i'm like all of a sudden the protestants became catholics and started really caring about the nicene creed um <laughs> like including ones that historically don't like baptists like it's just right. like it's like like uh be, because it is funny whenever like i meet someone from the lds who's like i didn't realize that people in the south didn't think we were christians i'm like no, they don't also don't think Catholics are Christians, but they really don't think you are. They think you're like pagans or something. I don't know. Like, um, and, and like, well, yeah, I didn't realize that they wouldn't let us into the Christian school. I'm like, yeah, I, they don't like you. Like, <laughs> like they might be politically aligned with you, but like, like it's out of desperation, my friend. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> yeah. um, it's. I mean, and, and it is, I, I think, as, as a kind of note to end off of, it is interesting. I, I was um, thinking about your your uh, term about cultural history. You know, as I said, like, I, you know, I have a, a very socialist orientation, but, like, I have had to complicate, like, vulgar, like, vulgar Marxist historiography with dealing with social reproduction and going, like, well, this is not all about just power. Like, it isn't. There is something else going on here. That is not just cynical manipulation. Yes, we've left out the power relations in the past and like, you know, like the trusting narratives of of religion and that was bad. But there's also a way in which like community survival, social reproduction and all this stuff is very much tied into this in a way that isn't just cynical. Like mm -hmm. there's cynical parts of it. Absolutely. And particularly when we're talking about someone like Smith or Brigham Young, but there's also non-cynical parts of it. And, um, you know, I, I think... One of the things about the LDS, and uh, ironically, weirdly, and kind of bizarrely, I think South Park, of all places, kind of got onto this. Is like, well, it's, you know, yes, it's yes, all the the warts are are obvious, and you know, the seer stone stuff and the gold plates, and it's a little bit like easy to make fun of, but also you're kind of a bigot for doing that because, like I said earlier, it, like this applies to almost all the religions that you come across with, and even some of the 
frankly, secular movements, whatever secular movement means, um, that you come across with too. Like there's always shenanigans and bullshit and and um, pseudo epistemology and faux applications of of this and sectarianism. I mean, you know, as as a person coming out of the left, like we know about sectarianism. Um, like it's something we're probably better at than even Christians. Um, <laughs> so like it's it, it is it is it is something to kind of have to deal with and i don't think you can simply just wipe it away and be like oh it's just power relations like i don't think it's that at all i think it's a lot more complicated than that. that yeah and and that's really why i personally situate myself in a conversation between intellectual history and cultural history mm -hmm. um historically I, I i've studied the history of ideas and I, my undergrad was in philosophy at byu and and so it's it's really that kind of that the flo history of philosophy yes, you're history one of, of those um, yeah I, yeah <laughs> No, I, I, I am. A, I got interested in anthropology because I dropped out of a philosophy degree and it seemed close when I was building a little bit of history. <laughs> like, I feel you. Um, I was, uh, um, I was actually, uh, uh, this will be my last comment and I'll, I will wrap up the show. But like, I was actually recently taking a group of high school students from a public school, which is bizarre in and of itself. I don't want to get into like, uh, the 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 weird paradoxes I felt as an agent of the state, uh, <laughs> taking taking kids to different schools in Utah, and we went to BYU, and I was both horrified and impressed simultaneously. It'll do that with too. with with BYU culture because I've been to many religious campuses in my my life, you know, even like Liberty University and stuff like that. And one of the things that I was interested in about BYU culture is while it is secularizing, while it has like its own form of DEI that it calls something else because that's too liberal, but we have the same thing anyway. Um, and while there's plenty of people, like I know all the professors in the literature department and they're all basically heathens except for the fantasy writers. But, um, but yeah, it was interesting where you're like, oh, I feel like this is what Brandeis would have been like for Jews or Notre Dame would have been like for Catholics in the 60s. Like, this mm -hmm. is a really, like, it's approaching secular culture. It's engaging with secular culture. It is definitely, it's got secular professors in it and stuff like that, even though they have to, like, kind of stay chill with the LDS. And you have to, but at the same time, it does have a culture that is a part and you feel it the moment you step on campus. And that's not true for a lot of Protestant Christianity uh, today. Like, like if I was to go to, I, I actually did. I almost went to Mercer several times, actually. Mm -hmm. And I've been to Mercer campus all the time. And, you know, yes, they've left the Southern Conventions, uh, Baptist Convention now, and they're like mainstream Baptists or whatever. For those of you who don't follow the weird associations of minor, uh, you know, tiered colleges i mean important but not huge colleges in the south um yet there's nothing about mercer culture that feels religious like, even though it is a religious school even though you have to do religious studies classes like it doesn't feel religious um byu still does like and that's that's an interesting thing about why well, i think if you're going to study if you're a religious studies person in the u.s like and you don't want to study like, you know, marginal weirdo post boomer religions like American Theravada Buddhism or something. Um, you're going to want to study something like LDS because you can learn a lot probably about prior religious cultures and its, and its conversation with mainstream modernity from it in ways that you can't for exactly any even evangelical culture today. Like one of the things that i point out you know like oh all the evangelical all the white oh let me rephrase that all the white evangelicals are trumpists now and i'm like that's because they've lost their own culture like they don't have their own they, mm -hmm. like like yes christian nationalism has always been around and it's always gonna be like there's gonna be something like it probably forever even if it's not christian but like like there's something very specifically weirdly about, and I'm not even going to say secular, there's something very declinist about evangelical religion that happened very fast when it, like, when you see it go from, like, kind of its own thing in the 90s and the early aughts to, like, we just do what Trump says and that's what we believe, even though some of it's blatantly in contradiction with our own values and history. Um, and the LDS, interestingly, and these subgroups, like we were talking about, like, you know, these Bensonites, they actually are a part. Sincerely, 
So um, it just tells you where they're at religiously. Now, are they going to stay white night that way? Who knows? It does feel like there's a lot of ex-Mormons lately. Um, maybe it's just because I live in Utah. <laughs> like, and I live in Gomorrah, which, you know, like... <laughs> Uh, you know, the history of Salt Lake is quite funny because, like, this was majority LDS until very recently, and now it's only like thirty percent LDS. Like, yeah. Um, and when you go to Utah County, which for those of you who aren't used to the, to the political geography of Utah, that is the urban but conservative side of the state. Um, it feels very different. Um, but even that, I'm hearing, is less and less actually LDS all the time. Yeah. So. Yeah, all the Latter-day Saint centers are are definitely losing losing ground that way. And, and self identity, it's really hard to to gauge right now what the the percentage of people who are resigning. I mean, there's a mass exodus out of organized religion anyway, but mm -hmm. there's a very specific brand of that going on with within the Latter-day Saint culture. But for those who are interested in 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 Mormon studies and in any kind of religious history, if you're like looking for a something to pick. Um, there is a lot to get, to glean from, and there is a lot of good scholarship. It's really weird because Mormon studies, the fact that there is, there is even a Mormon studies category, and you won't have like a Jehovah's Witness category or Seventh-day Adventist category of this with this way, but it's been said that Mormonism doesn't have a formal theology. It has a history that it treats like a theology. Mm. And so because of that, it's, it's, it's steeped in this really rich historiographical narrative of itself and about how it's evolved. I, I find the historiography of Mormon studies fascinating in how that tracks with the, with the academic community um, writ large. But, the, but how it's actually coming about now in the last 20 years, it used to be that up until about 2000 or so, well, 1993 to 2000, it was that all of the scholars of the Mormon scholars doing Mormon history were doing church history and is from a scholarly perspective. Uh, right. They were documenting the history of the church from a scholarly perspective. That changed about 20 years ago. So mm. now it, you have scholars that are t talking about more theory and they're using Mormonism as a case study. So it's no longer church history. It's, it's talking about Mormonism as this entity that's affecting change and being affected by change and it's really produced some some really really great scholarship so if anybody's interested definitely check it out there's there's good stuff there yeah uh thank you so much um uh, i'm going to ask you to do two recommendations i don't normally ask this first one can you recommend some books that people who are completely unfamiliar to mormon studies and don't know anything that we've been talking about have been confused for the last two hours um <laughs> can, can read and then uh, where can people find your work? <laughs> okay, so the uh, yeah, a couple books to read on Mormon studies. So Jan Ships writes really the first non, she's a non-Latter-day Saint who writes really the first treatment of Mormonism in, in a scholarly way. It's in the late 80s. Um, and so her, her book uh, on, on Mormonism. And it, for those who want to know more about Joseph Smith, Richard Bushman is still kind of the standard for a history of, uh, of, of, uh, of that. And so check out Richard Bushman's, his book's called Rough Stone Rolling. There is a brand new book out uh, last year by uh, Kate Mormon or Kay Mormon. Her, her last name, it's fascinating. She, she was actually at the conference. She, she, uh, she read for, uh, for our panel, but uh, it, it is M-O-H-R-M-A-N is her last name. And she, she grew up in, in Utah, but she wasn't Latter-day Saint. Uh, and so <laughs> she laughs at her name was phonetically Mormon, but anyway, it's, it's, it's a funny story. Um, and her book is, in fact, I have it right here. It's, uh, it's called exceptionally queer. Um, except you can't really tell her there, but yeah, exceptionally queer. This talks about Mormon peculiarity and U S nationalism. And she uses uh, queer theory to be able to talk about this, 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 conversation between Mormon identity and peculiarity and American exceptionalism and how those reified and how they renegotiated with each other using queer. It's a, it's a brilliant book. Absolutely. Absolutely love this book. So, so ch definitely check that out. And yeah, over, over the next little bit, I, I would highly suggest anybody who's interested in, in the stuff we do at Claremont, uh, you can check out the Claremont Graduate University Mormon Studies page. There is a, a growing, a growing collection of oral histories, which is where all of my work's going. It's going to be a while before I release my my uh, my collection, 
but we'll, we'll have we'll have anywhere between 100 to 150 oral histories for the liberty community for for this group that we're talking about um, of of people who are, who self-identify as libertarians, anarchists, constitutionalists, Skousenites, King of Godders, preppers, militiamen, those kinds of people, and people in the communities with them and Monday and all those people about how they're negotiating their identity, how they perceive themselves as Latter-day Saints and how they negotiate these political philosophies. So like I said, I'm right in between intellectual history and cultural history. It's like, where do these ideas come from? And then how, how what's the lived experience about how people are representing those ideas and finding identity and meaning from it in a, in a discursive way. And so we'll, we'll be releasing that. But currently there's a, a growing a growing podcast, uh, a growing oral history with an attached podcast at Claremont Graduate University and on the Mormon Studies page that you can Google that talks about global Mormon experiences. And uh, and those are great. So check those out. All right. Thank you so much. And have a good rest of your evening.